Commonly known as germs, the human microbiome was virtually unheard of until recently. It is the latest buzzword in medicine and the subject of many news articles and talk shows. As I'm sure Rob will share, the study of the microbiome is leading to fascinating discoveries, some of which are taking place right here on our campus at the Center for Microbiome Innovation. Knight is the founding director of the center, which leverages the university's strengths from interdisciplinary fields of study to coordinate and accelerate microbiome research. Now please join me in welcoming Professor Rob Knight. Great. Uh, thanks, thanks so much, Tammy, for that very kind introduction. What I'll tell you about is some of the, uh, the cutting-edge microbiome research that's going on right here at UCSD, some of the background behind, uh, behind it is good, and then um, some, of, uh, some of what's in it. So uh, all of this really started in 2012 uh, when I was visiting ICDDRB in Bangladesh, where they have one of the world's best cholera hospitals, and uh, we were working with uh, Dr. Tamid Ahmed, on, uh, on, a, on a project funded by the, Ga the Gates Foundation looking at microbes and malnutrition. And uh, it was just heartbreaking to see, uh, to, to see these, uh, the, these infants who were the same age as my daughter, uh, then just three months old, but only about a third of her body weight. And uh, it was amazing to see what they were doing with nutrition, with rehydration therapy, uh, and with microbiome-based discoveries to be able to restore these children to health. And uh, the parents who were bringing their, their children into ICDDRB all had, uh, all, all had uh, a very important question, which is, um, which is, what should I do about my child's microbiome? And uh, as a parent of a young child myself, uh, that was a question that I had uh, as, as, as well, uh, given that there were all these completely unresolved issues around what are the effects of C-section, what are the effects of breastfeeding, all of these other things that happen in early life, and then uh, understanding what you could do uh, to give your child the best start was, uh, was, was, was certainly very compelling. So um, what's, what's enabling all of this is uh, revolutions in DNA sequencing. And in part due to the efforts of local companies like Illumina, there's been this revolution in DNA sequencing over the last 15 years. So it's got 10,000 times cheaper in the last 15 years, a million times cheaper in the last 20. And that's how Bill Gates can be thinking about not just sequencing his own microbiome, but sequencing the microbiome of thousands of malnourished children in the developing world uh, to understand better how to set them up for the best start in life. Um, and these discoveries are really changing even how we think of ourselves as human beings. So I'd like you to take a moment just to consider what did you see when you looked in the mirror this morning? I saw an organism that's just 43% human. And not just because it was early and I hadn't had my coffee yet. Uh, but when we think about what makes us up as human beings, uh, our bodies consist of about 30 trillion human cells and about 39 trillion microbial cells, according to the latest numbers. Um, and so that's where this 43% human number comes from. Now, you might be thinking, well, well wait a minute. Uh, why do we care about the counts of cells? Surely it's our DNA that matters. So let's think about this again at the genetic level. Each of us has about 20,000 human genes, depending on exactly what you want to count as a gene. But amazingly, we've found that the size of our microbial gene catalog ranges from two to 20 million microbial genes. And so by that measure, we're at best 1% human. And you might have heard of a lot of excitement about systems biology, even systems medicine, but it's hard to do systems anything if you're neglecting 99% of that system, which is what we're doing when we're neglecting our microbial genes. But what's perhaps, what's perhaps most important, though, is that remember that our human genes, we can't change, right? We're fixed with those human genes at birth. Whereas, as I'll show you, our microbiomes are, incre are incredibly malleable. And so it provides an incredible message of hope that those 99% of the genes doing all these metabolic reactions are the part of the system that we can change if we just knew the right direction to change it. So uh, this is really a big data problem, and it turns out to be literally true that each teaspoon of your stool contains within the microbial DNA the, ama the amount of data that it would take literally a ton of DVDs to store. Right? So this is a major archival challenge, and you, th you can think about that the next time you're in the bathroom taking a data dump, as it were. <laughs> 
And uh, now that we can read out all this data, uh, because it's a million times cheaper to do it than it was just 20 years ago, we're now starting to discover that the microbiome affects all kinds of things that we had no idea it was involved in. And this includes a lot of the traditional childhood diseases that my colleagues in the Department of Pediatrics and at Ready Children's Hospital study, including things like necrotizing enterocolitis, asthma, type 1 diabetes, but also so-called emerging childhood diseases that used to not affect children very often, but now we see increasingly in younger and younger people. These are things like non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, obesity and type 2 diabetes, uh, even cardiovascular issues and IBD, which used to be much more diseases of adults, and many others. And so we're trying to understand what is the, micro what is the role of the microbiome in these processes, and can we stop them? And one thing that's not yet widely appreciated, in part because it was discovered less than a decade ago, is that the microbiome also affects how you respond to drugs. And this, is, uh, this has now been shown for a growing list ranging from acetaminophen, which is the active ingredient in Tylenol, to a whole range of different anti-cancer drugs, uh, um, cardiac agents, and so forth. And what's especially important about this is that essentially all of the research on whether these drugs work for you or not have been, has been done in adults. And we know almost nothing about what happens in children, where we're now seeing that the microbiome is completely different. And so the effects of, process, of the microbiome in processing these drugs as well as the effect of these drugs on the microbiome itself might be completely different. And that'll become important for reasons that uh, that'll be clear later in the talk. Um, so one really important question is, are we unintentionally degrading our microbiome through things that we're doing to keep us well? And over the course of the 20th century, there were remarkable public health advances. And I don't want to diminish the importance of those advances in terms of, uh, in, in terms of providing solutions to a lot of these childhood diseases and even adult diseases caused by single pathogens. So the rates of everything from measles to tuberculosis uh, caused by single organisms declined precipitously over the 20th century due to advances in public health uh, practices and advances in technology. But at the same time, we saw this explosion in chronic disease including things like multiple sclerosis and Crohn's disease and type 1 diabetes and asthma. And what amazes me is that when this article was published a little over a decade ago in the New England Journal of Medicine, one of the most prestigious medical, medical journals, uh, none of these diseases had been, had been linked to the microbiome. Whereas today, uh, we know from epidemiological data uh, in humans and also from detailed studies of mechanism in rodent models that all four of those diseases and dozens of others are linked to the microbiome. And uh, my colleague Marty Blazer at NYU has, has written this wonderful book called Missing Microbes that explores how we're depleting our microbial ecosystems and how we might be able to restore some of these microbes we've lost. But uh, this, is, uh, this is very much uh, a book alerting the public to the problem and doesn't tell you a lot about what you personally can do about it if you're concerned about your child. So, uh, so what's driving all these discoveries is that we can map our microbiomes like never before. And a lot, of these, uh, a lot of these advances in technology are happening right here at UCSD or in the broader San Diego region. And um, if, you, if I ask you to think about a classic microbe out of the gut, you probably think of this organism, E. coli. And it's true, I can isolate E. coli probably for most of you in this room, but it's not a dominant player in your gut ecosystem. And in fact, in most healthy people, it makes up about one cell out of a million of the microbes in your gut. So why do we think of it as a classic gut bacterium? Well, the fact is that it's really good at growing in a test tube or in a petri dish, but unfortunately, looking at just the organisms that we can grow in culture is a lot like going down to the San Diego Zoo and trying to understand the rainforest by looking at each organism that grows well in captivity, each in its individual cage, knowing nothing about the environment or the other animals that it interacts with. And so uh, what we have to do instead of using this kind of culture-based approach is that we have to do DNA sequencing directly to understand the, uh, the microbial ecosystem as an ecosystem right there uh, where it exists in the body. So in the Human Microbiome Project, uh, which I participated in in several capacities, this was a large organization of about 400 researchers around the country, uh, funded by NIH, where the goal of this project was just to look at what is a healthy microbiome. So we looked at about 250 healthy people uh, at up to three time points and at up to 18 sites on the body, which as you can imagine is a lot of places to stick a Q-tip, right? And uh, in this project, we collected four and a half trillion bases, so 1,500 times the size of the human genome, all in microbial DNA. 
And one thing that was amazing about this project is how quickly the results uh, escaped from the specialty scientific journals like Science and Nature. So a few weeks later, uh, they were on the cover of Scientific American, and a couple of weeks after that, on the cover of The Economist. And so the idea that this is not just uh, a really important science, but increasingly economically important activity is really starting to get into the public consciousness. Uh, but the, so, so the great thing about this project, as I said, is we had an unprecedented amount of DNA sequence data, four and a half trillion A's, T's, G's, and C's from all of these sites on all of these people. But that was also the terrible thing about the project. And just to illustrate the problem, here's the first file of data from the Human Microbiome Project. And it's pretty hard to tell who lives where in the environment from this, right? Despite the fact that what we're doing is fundamentally an ecology project. And uh, for example, you probably can't even tell that's an oral sample. And this is just the first 0.1% of this file, and there's another 17,000 files just like it. And uh, this, this is really a problem because we have, uh, we, we have parents coming in uh, to the Department of Pediatrics saying, um, uh, you know, hey doc, I have some great news for you, which is that I had my kid's microbiome done, and now I have this list of a thousand species that they found in his gut. And surely with all this data, you can tell me what's wrong with them, right? <laughs> and, and I mean, uh, you know, what's your physician going to do? Refer you to colleagues in psychiatry for being crazy enough to think you could go through all that in, in the 12 beautiful minutes you have together, right? And so, uh, so, so our, our, our job as researchers is to make it not crazy anymore and figure out how to take that microbiome profile and integrate it with your kids' data over time or with data from other people so that you can understand and interpret it obviously and intuitively in that very brief period that you have together. So applying tools that we developed in my lab that I won't get into, uh, although I'd be happy to answer questions about them, we turned all of that sequence data into this map of the healthy human microbiome. And each point on this map represents all the complexity of a microbiome as read out by the DNA that we extract from it. And uh, we place two points close together on the map if they have more similar microbes, and we place them further apart if the microbes in them are more dissimilar. So remember these are all healthy people, so none of the variation in this is driven by disease, right? Uh, and if I show you the main thing going on, what we see is that the different parts of the body emerge as being like different continents of this map where the mouth, the skin, uh, the vaginal, and the fecal uh, microbiomes are almost like defining different continents on this map. And to illustrate this, I'm showing you the mouth and the gut of the first person in the HMP, and you can see they're in completely different regions on this microbiome map. Now, it wasn't until we started doing the Earth Microbiome Project, uh, which there'll be a fairly big announcement about next week if all goes well, so I'm not going to say too much about it today. Uh, but basically what we did is we crowdsourced uh, samples from across the planet uh, from tens of thousands of sites. And so what we could do is we could go out on the planet's surface and we could ask what two microbiomes are as distinct from one another as the mouth and the gut of this one individual. So if you think of your mouth as being kind of like this coral reef, you have these complex mineralized structures, they're covered with biofilms, maybe your dentist bugs you about those from time to time. The amazing fact is that your mouth is as far away from your gut in terms of its microbiome as the water in that reef is from the dirt in this prairie. And that's amazing, right? Because it means a few feet along the length of your body makes as much difference to your microbiomes as thousands of miles across the Earth's surface, and we never expected that. So, um, so to illustrate what happens in disease, what I'm showing you now is the microbiomes of some people with C. diff. And that's these orange symbols here. Uh, remember, C. diff is one of the most important hospital-acquired infections. It's a nasty form of diarrhea that resists antibiotics, and it kills 17,000 people a year in the US alone. And stool samples from people with C. diff shown up here look absolutely nothing like healthy stool. And so what's going to happen is that four of these patients are going to get a stool transplant from one donor who, as you can see, is in the healthy region of the plot. And if you're wondering what a stool transplant is, here's our chair of gastroenterology, Bill Sanborn, uh, about to deliver one using hospital-grade stool that he got from a nonprofit called Open Biome. Because remember that the FDA regulates stool as a drug, so don't try this at home. <laughs> Um, okay, so what's going to happen is four of these patients with C. diff are going to get a transplant from one donor. And the question is, with that, little vial of, uh, with that little vial of donated stool, are you even going to see any effect at the whole microbiome level, right? Or is it just going to, is it just going to be lost in the noise? And so uh, this animation was put together by Yoshiki and Antonio, two very talented computer scientists in my lab. And the question is, uh, how much are they going to come to resemble the healthy people? Will the progression be fast or slow? Uh, will it be smooth or will they detour along the way? And each frame in this is just one day in the lives of these patients. And I'm going to start this going. And what you can see is 
immediately. All of them move completely into the healthy state in just two or three days. And coupled to this, all of their clinical symptoms vanish. So they're producing healthy stool again for the first time in years in some cases. And uh, they stay in this healthy region and their symptoms are gone during months of follow-up. And, so, uh, and so amazingly, this fecal transplant, although it may, send, uh, although it may sound kind of gross, uh, has been an amazingly effective uh, a treatment for C. diff with cure rates over 90% reported in many studies, whereas antibiotics are only 30 to 40% effective. And so that's why you should care about where you are on this kind of microbiome map, and also why you'd much rather look at this kind of display than trolling through thousands and thousands of sequences of A's, T's, G's, and C's. So what we're trying to figure out at the moment is for what other diseases can we identify problems in the microbiome like this that we can display very clearly in a way that you can track progress of the therapy and how can we guide it back into health, whether it's something as extreme as a fecal transplant or as gentle as diet, which also has a massive impact on your microbiome or something in between. And so what we're doing at the moment is for all of these different diseases that have been linked to the microbiome and causally associated in animal models, uh, what we're trying to do is figure out what are the good places and the bad places on this map associated with these different diseases, and uh, then develop a kind of microbiome GPS that tells you not just where am I right now, uh, but where do I want to go on the map, and what do I need to do turn by turn to either stay in the good places or move from the bad places into the good places. Um, so, uh, so a lot of what I've shown you so far has come from large government-sponsored projects, which are great in terms of getting a lot of stuff done, uh, but they have a real issue in terms, of, uh, in, in terms of your ability to participate as a member of the public. And um, this, this was another important key point in the genesis of the book, which was that it, uh, in, in 2010, uh, I founded this project called the Earth Microbiome Project, together with Jack Gilbert, uh, Janet Jensen, and, and Rick Stevens. And, uh, Jack is, uh, and, and Jack is my co-author on, on Dirt is Good. And uh, essentially what we, what we did is we exploited the decline in cost in DNA sequencing to let anyone, um, to any researcher on the planet, write a brief description about why their samples were interesting and then send, send it to one of our labs so that we could process them with a standardized pipeline and understand what was going on. So uh, before too long, um, a lot of individual members of the public were asking, how can I contribute a microbiome sample myself? And so in collaboration with the Human Food Project, uh, we started this new project called American Gut, which basically allowed anyone to, uh, to claim a pin for themselves on this microbiome map using crowdsourcing to get the samples from members of the public and crowdfunding uh, so that it's like Na National Ge Geographic's Genographic Project where each person um, supports the cost of adding themselves to the project. Um, and then with citizen science. So a lot of the questions that we have in this project come from people who are participating who have interesting questions that we can answer about their microbiome. Of course, it turns out that not everyone wants to know what's in there. So these are middle schoolers touring our lab and learning that we're going to use lasers and robots to study the bacteria in their poop, all of which is literally true, by the way. Um, but with a project on the scale, so most citizen science projects are on the scale of a, two, uh, of a few thousand dollars, but in this one we've raised over two million dollars already, and we've, sample, we've sequenced over 10,000 samples and released all of the data free on the internet so that any student, any educator, any researcher, any interested member of the public can just go to this free open resource and see what a lot of microbiomes look like and every single step that we use to go from the data to the results. And what's been remarkable uh, having data on the scale is that we've seen associations between the microbiome and all kinds of things that you wouldn't expect. So you probably expected that diet and age and antibiotics affected your microbiome, but you might not have expected that it was associated with things like sleep or exercise or what season of the year you sample your microbiome in, all of which we discovered first through American Gut. So uh, mostly what I've been talking about is adults so far, and uh, what, we talk in the, uh, what we talk about in the book is children. And in particular, uh, at this point you may be wondering, well, where do these highly differentiated microbiomes that we have as adults come from in the first place? Where do we begin on this microbiome map? And if you have dogs or kids as I do, you likely have some dark suspicions about that, all of which are true, by the way. So it turns out that I can actually match you up to your dog with fairly high precision by looking at the DNA of the microbes that you share. Uh, however, before you panic about what you're getting from your dog, I want to reassure you that most of these environmental exposures we're now learning are good rather than bad. 
And so, uh, and, and so uh, you might have seen press accounts of this paper that we published last year with Chris Lowry's group at Boulder. Um, and uh, what was fascinating about this paper is that we showed that we could actually take mice that, were, uh, that we were putting into a social stress condition and we could vaccinate those mice against stress and against the mouse equivalent of PTSD uh, by, uh, by, by exposing them to the right kind of bacteria out of the soil. And other environmental bacteria have been shown to reduce or even reverse asthma and food allergies uh, in, uh, in experimental models. And for peanut allergies, even in children, uh, in Mimi Tang's recent immunotherapy studies uh, in, in Australia. So this is a very exciting emerging area of research that presents completely new therapies uh, for some of these diseases that are increasing very rapidly. Now, uh, in all seriousness, how we're born has a tremendous impact on our first microbes. And so back in 2010, uh, I, 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 did, um, I did some work with Maria Gloria dominguez Bello, sampling mothers an hour before they gave birth, and then their children 20 minutes, uh, 20 minutes after they were born. And what we saw is this tremendous effect on del uh, delivery mode on the newborn microbiome. Um, so what you can see here is uh, samples in pink, samples from all over the babies, including the first fecal samples they produced, uh, delivered, by, uh, delivered vaginally. They cluster with the vaginal samples of the mother. Uh, whereas in contrast, uh, when you see babies delivered by C-section, samples from all of their bodies, uh, all over their bobby, uh, bodies, don't look like the vaginally delivered babies at all, but instead look like skin. Now, um, a year later, uh, when, uh, when, uh, when, uh, when my own child was born, uh, we, we had a very detailed birth plan and uh, plans for what we were going to do afterwards, uh, informed by research like this. But uh, as those of you who have children yourselves know, as soon as, the, as soon as the baby comes, probably all of your plans go out the window. And so, uh, unfortunately, we had to have an unplanned C-section, um, and then breastfeeding didn't work either. And uh, again, that was, uh, that, that was a huge motivation to look at what the research said, right? Because again, we had just shown this huge effect of the initial microbiome um, uh, on, uh, sorry, the, uh, of delivery mode on the initial baby's microbiome. There was a lot of research suggesting that breast milk was good later on, and not very much research asking what can you do uh, if you're not able to do those things. So, uh, so, so we in fact took matters into our own hand, uh, into our own hands in the hospital. And uh, after the medical staff were out of the room, uh, we quickly uh, inoculated our baby with the vaginal microbes that she would have had had she be had had she come out the regular way. And uh, and as you can infer from context, and this one it was when I was still in Boulder, uh, the medical staff were not on board with that idea whatsoever. <laughs> uh, although our doula was very much in favour of it. Although you should, uh, although it's um, although I should let you know that the uh, that the, the AAP recommendation is that you should not do this until there's a lot more research, because it's true that if you have group B strep or other, uh, uh, other, um, uh, other bacterial infections, you could pass those on to your newborn in, in a life-threatening manner. And uh, I knew that my partner was free, of, uh, was, was free of a lot of those things, which is why we thought that, was, uh, that it was a reasonable idea to do it on, on first principles. So following up with this uh, in, in later work with Gloria, um, and this was published in, in Nature Medicine last year. Uh, we studied, uh, we, we studied uh, newborns from three groups of women. So women who were going to deliver vaginally, uh, those who were going to deliver by a planned C-section, and those who were going to deliver by C-section and then immediately uh, inoculate their babies with vaginal microbes afterwards. And uh, I'm, I'm going to show you a few graphs. Uh, and this is data not from immediately after we did the procedure, but a month after the babies were born. And what you can see um, is uh, in, each, in each of these graphs, the left panel is C-section, the right is vaginal, and uh, the middle panel is this exposed delivery mode. And for a range of bacteria and for a range of sites in the body, we were able to show uh, that, that we saw a substantial change in the microbiome a month later. And so, um, so what's, what's exciting about this? So, uh, you know, with my own child, uh, she's very healthy now um, uh, as, uh, as, as a five-year-old. We feel very glad about that. Uh, but if you're talking about a sample size of just one subject, um, you can never know what really went on, right? No matter how much you might love that one individual. But uh, with, um, with, with the larger sample size, we can start to show systematically what the change in the microbiome is. And we're now analyzing another 16,000 samples on this project, which is going to allow us to, to a much de a greater degree ask whether these differences in the initial microbiome are the cause of some of the differences uh, on average between C-section and vaginally delivered babies in terms of asthma, allergies, and many other conditions. Although before you panic, remember the most likely outcome of C-section is that your baby is going to be fine as ours was. Uh, over a large population, though, all of these things start to add up. So you may be wondering, um, uh, what, what can you do afterwards? And uh, one very exciting uh, piece of research from, uh, from, um, uh, from, from uh, Marty Blazer's lab 
uh, he's, the, he's the author of that Missing Microbes book, is that breast milk may actually reverse the effects of antibiotics and C-section right around birth in terms of a lot of these epidemiological consequences and as well as effects on the microbiome. And uh, we actually have a large uh, breast milk centre here at UCSD in the same building that I work in, uh, directed by Lars Bodhi, uh, where we're trying to address a lot of these questions in much more detail and use the milk bank that's associated with this LRF Mommy Core uh, to answer a lot of questions about what specific, uh, uh, what specific parts of the breast milk have these beneficial consequences, either for full-term infants or for necrotizing enterocolitis, uh, which is a big problem and where breast milk is a surprisingly effective treatment. So there's a lot of research on this kind of thing going on right here at UCSD. Now, uh, in terms of what happens um, later in development, uh, this is some work we did with Ruth Lay, who's uh, now a director at the Max Planck Institute in Tübingen. And um, what, what I'm going to show you is data we collected looking at, one, uh, looking at one infant over the first two and a half years of life. And so this yellow dot is the starting point on the microbiome map. And as you can see, he's in the vaginal region of the plot, which is what we would expect from his delivery mode. And what I'm going to show in this uh, journey through the map is his journey week to week to week over the first two and a half years. And in case you're wondering why two and a half years, that's when he was toilet trained. And as you can imagine, it's a hell of a lot easier to get the sample out of diapers than to fight a toddler who's probably learned how to flush, right? So a lot of these studies tend to end at about that, uh, at about that time. Now remember, um, each, each step in this animation is a week in uh, the journey of this, uh, of, the, of this child's developing microbiome through the microbiome map. And I'm just going to start this going, and you can see sometimes there's tremendous change one week to the next. Uh, other times it's just a little change. And remember that what matters on this map is primarily the distance between successive points. And uh, some of these differences one week to the next are bigger than the difference between any two healthy adults in the entire human microbiome project. So if you're thinking that your kid is a different person one week to the next, that may literally be true in terms of his microbiome, which remember is where most of his genes are anyway. So coming up here is something fascinating. So he gets antibiotics for an ear infection. You see that massive regression of the microbiome followed by a rapid recovery. And that went by pretty fast, so I'm just going to rewind it for you and play it for you again. And what you're seeing is that on administration of oral amoxicillin for an ear infection, we see this massive regression of the microbiome, undoing months of development in just a few weeks. But then he's resilient. He bounces right back to where he was before the antibiotics. And by the time he gets to two and a half years, you can see he's basically in the healthy adult region, which is what we see across many, many children that we've studied, where in general, by the time they're two and a half to three years old, uh, their microbiome basically looks like an adult's microbiome. But not every child and not every, uh, not every adult is resilient like that. And one thing we're doing at the moment is trying to find out why. Uh, why, do some, why do some kids fall off this, uh, this kind of microbiome curve, which you can think of as analogous to the, to the height and weight charts that you do at the pediatrician's office. And um, in fact, we're doing this kind of thing right now uh, in collaboration with Julie Rue at Rady Children's Hospital. Uh, we're trying to build a microbial growth curve, not just for one child, uh, but for the diverse populations of children that we see at Rady. And in particular, trying to understand what's happening with the children who come into the emergency department and can we predict what they'll ultimately be discharged with and what, tre uh, what treatment they'll need from their microbiomes as they come in, as well as trying to understand what's normal uh, for the ethnically and culturally diverse populations that we have right here in San Diego. So, um, so on, on the basis of this kind of thing, and especially the American Gut Project, Jack and I started getting a lot of questions from, uh, for, from members of the public uh, after, after we gave lectures. So things like, is it okay for my kid to eat dirt? Uh, can antibiotics affect my infant? Uh, how does diet affect the microbiome? Uh, should I get a dog for my kid's microbiome? The answer to that one seems to be pretty clearly yes, by the way, in terms of the evidence base that we have so far, but only if your child is two or younger. Um, and, and then I read somewhere that micro microbes can cause obesity. Is that true? And uh, th this is one that I get a lot because, uh, among other topics, my lab studied microbes and obesity for about the last 12 years, uh, together with Jeff Gordon and many other collaborators. And uh, it's absolutely true that microbes can cause obesity if you're a lab mouse, where we can uh, manipulate the mouse's weight very effectively based on changing the microbes in it. Uh, what is less clear is whether it's causal for obesity as opposed to just associated with obesity in humans. But it's definitely something that we're trying to find out. And if we can translate those results from mice into humans, 
um, that'll certainly be very, uh, very exciting and uh, potentially commercially applicable, right? Like if we can cure obesity with the right probiotic, we probably won't have to write any more grants, but it's really a long <laughs> shot. <laughs> So, um, so, so anyway, so, uh, so, so what we did is we took hundreds of these questions and we enlisted, um, as, and we enlisted uh, Sandy Blakesley, who's a, who's a writer at the New York Times, as part of this project. And uh, we, we put together, uh, we, we, we organized these questions into 14 chapters that basically go through everything that you might want to know about the microbiome as it relates to your kid. So the first couple of chapters are just background about the microbiome and how it applies to humans in particular. Then we talk about the microbiome in pregnancy, then birth, then breastfeeding, uh, then antibiotics and probiotics, uh, then um, your, your child's diet, uh, things going on with your child's gut, uh, depression, um, like especially, uh, uh, especially postpartum depression, uh, vaccines, um, uh, various factors in the environment, uh, various health conditions, and then finally microbiome testing and trying to separate the hype from the reality of what you can expect today uh, with a microbiome test of your child versus what you might expect from a reasonable extrapolation of where the technology is going. Um, so anyway, uh, so, um, so all of this is the work of a huge number, uh, um, is, is based on the scientific research of a huge number of people. Um, this, is, uh, this is the current member, members of my lab uh, at, at UCSD, uh, outside the building where we work and where the milk bank that I told you about is as well. But uh, taken collectively, UCSD has really become a hub of microbiome research, and the Center for Microbiome Innovation now has over 120 faculty members associated with it. Uh, we have an increasing roster of uh, companies either supporting the center directly or doing sponsored research with us. And what's exciting about this is it includes everything from technology development to applications of the microbiome to even data science. So you might have seen an announcement a couple of weeks ago uh, about, um, uh, about a project that we're doing with IBM, where essentially what we're trying to do is use its Watson artificial intelligence technology so that instead of uh, puzzling over that microbiome profile yourself, maybe you'll just be able to ask Watson on your phone, what does this microbiome mean? And that may sound crazy, but I think it's the kind of thing that we'll be looking at uh, in, the next, uh, in the next five to 10 years based on the progress that we're making in the field. Um, so with that, uh, I'd, I'd be uh, like I'm sure uh, I'm sure that like other people who have uh, found out about the microbiome, many of you have a lot of questions. Um, I'd, I'd be delighted to answer any of those questions that you have. And if we don't get to your question here tonight, uh, please do feel free to email me. Um, my lab is just a few minutes walk across campus as well. Uh, so given that you got here, uh, one, one of the cool things about UCSD is just the sheer density of things like uh, you know um, the medical school being a few minutes walk in one direction, the supercomputer computer center being a, a few minutes walk in another, and the bioengineering department being a few, a few minutes walk in, in yet another. And uh, this kind of interdisciplinary collaboration is what really makes all of this stuff possible. Um, so uh, anyway, thanks again for coming along, and uh, thanks again to the, uh, to the library and to the bookstore for organizing this, and I'd be delighted to answer any questions you have. Thank you. So on your slides that had the um, microbiome separated into like vaginal, fecal, all that, mm -hmm. what exactly is the sort of metric of the separation? Is it just genetic differences between the different types of bacteria? Or? Yeah, that, that's a great question, and I promise I did not plant that question in the audience. So uh, one, one thing my lab introduced in 2005 was uh, a distance metric called Unifrac. And what we do is we, we, we use Darwin's insight that this is a universal tree of life that connects, all, uh, that, that connects all organisms. And what we do is for the microbes in uh, any community, we paint the tips of that phylogenetic tree represent the modern, uh, representing the modern sequences. So we do that for the first community and we do that for the second community. And then for each branch on the tree, we ask did it lead to members of the first community only or members of the second community only or did it lead to members of both communities? And so um, then what we do is we look at the fraction of the tree that's unique. So that's where the unifrac name comes from. And we summarize that information for all pairs of environments in a distance matrix uh, that we then apply a principal coordinates analysis to. And uh, that's what shows the plots that you're seeing there. Thank you. I wonder if you've looked at the differences in uh, various microbial diseases in primitive societies, current primitive societies versus industrialized societies with better public health measures and such. 
Um, yeah, again, that's a great question. So the um, so the uh, so, so the BMMI project, which is the project that uh, took me to Bangladesh in the first place, uh, the goal of that project is essentially to um, is essentially to look at the role of microbes in malnutrition and uh, to devise. Uh, so, so initially, we thought we would we would do fecal transplant, or we would find exciting probiotic strains out of the gut that we could administer. Uh, the regulatory framework prohibiting that is um, is, is fairly substantial. So uh, the project rapidly switched aims towards uh, finding the right food that would act as a fertilizer for the right kinds of microbes. Um, in, terms of, in terms of looking at, uh, looking at people in different societies around the world, uh, we've, we've done a lot of that. So for example, um, in 2014, uh, working with the Hadza hunter-gatherers who hunt and gather 95% of their calories still, I had the privilege of shaking hands with a man who, a couple of weeks before, had shot a giraffe with a bow and arrow that he made himself and uh, traded it to the um, traded it to members of the Datoga, who are the next group over, uh, for a cell phone, which, uh, which he keeps a battery of. Uh, like, he literally keeps, a, uh, keeps it topped up with, um, with, with electricity in minutes by gathering honey and then trading it at the trading post. Uh, um, and, uh, and uh, you know, it's just remarkable, the penetration of some of this uh, kind of technology throughout the world. But uh, lo looking at the Hadza and the Yanomami and um, other societies living very traditional lifestyles, we find entire phyla that we don't find in the gut of, um, of, of uh, people who are living more Western lifestyles. So for example, spirochetes, uh, I can guarantee that no one in this room has any spirochetes in their gut, but we find them very frequently in traditional societies, as well as a lot of kinds of bacteria at the phylum level that are only identified by numbers. Um, when we uh, when when we when we look at uh, when we look at different populations, uh, especially rural farmers like in Malawi, and um, and uh, let's see, well uh, I'll just I'll just cut this short. We we see we see a huge difference going from hunter gatherers to uh, subsistence agriculture, and then another huge change going from sus subsistence agriculture to modern societies. We think that change has happened very recently based on studies we've done of ancient DNA, looking at Vikings and looking at soldiers um, who were uh, buried in World War I in Europe, where uh, those people's microbiomes look more like the microbiomes of uh, current people practicing subsistence agriculture in Malawi than like modern Europeans. And uh, we, we also see um, also, also other people like Ram Xavier have seen very interesting changes in the Karelia region where you have uh, the border of Finland, Estonia and Russia where uh, you have an ethnically similar population. You have geopolitical boundaries that were, uh, that were drawn recently and the rates of asthma and allergies are dramatically lower in Russia than they are in Estonia and Finland. And uh, a fair amount of that is due to microbial exposures including in things like the house dust from agriculture. Uh, there's also some fascinating work we're doing with Erica von Mutius at the moment, um, looking at asthma in, in a Bavarian population. And uh, what, what's cool about that is going down, uh, going down uh, a street, there are individual houses that either bring a cow into the house or that don't have an animal. And the asthma risk is very different in the cow versus non-cow families. And we're currently tracking that back to individual, uh, individual kinds of bacteria that are transmitted from the cows uh, to the children and seem to provide a beneficial effect. Um, on, the, on the other hand, you know, getting a dog might seem like a reasonable commitment. <laughs> getting a cow, I'm guessing that's a little less appealing. Hi, Rob. I would like you to shed some light on the connection between, say, vaccinations, antibiotics, and conditions like MS, auto autoimmune conditions, and how would you spot healthy donors, and are there research studies about the subject right now? Yeah, great question. So, um, so I showed I showed you the dramatic impact of antibiotics on that one child's developing microbiome. Uh, the same child had all his vaccines. Uh, you didn't see any substantial impact on the vaccines, and that's consistent of the of the other data that we have. So, each vaccine is essentially protecting uh, protecting you against a very specific pathogen. Uh, as far as we've seen so far, vaccines don't seem to have a substantial impact on the rest of the microbiome. And one thing that's interesting about this is that many parents are worried, won't vaccines have a huge negative impact on my microbiome? Whereas they're not nearly as worried about antibiotics, which actually do have a large and in many cases negative impact on the microbiome. And I think part of the problem is that when you take antibiotics, you start off feeling sick and then you feel better almost immediately. Whereas uh, if, you, if, if, you, uh, if you're having a vaccine, you start off healthy and then you feel kind of crappy after you have the vaccine. So I think that's a very visceral response that's different between those two that lead to that difference in fear when in fact the risk is exactly the opposite of what you might expect, uh, at, least, at least based on the data we have so far. 
Um, in terms of screening a donor for fecal microbiota transplant, uh, that's still something that's very rapidly emerging. And um, part of the reason why it's emerging so rapidly is that we're making all these discoveries. So it was just in the last year uh, that my lab, in collaboration with a number of others, including Sarkis Masmania at Caltech, uh, Sergio Baranzini at UCSF, and, um, uh, and, and, uh, and a number of others, uh, linked, the, uh, linked the microbiome in humans to uh, Parkinson's disease and to multiple sclerosis. So, uh, so now suddenly you have to worry, does my, does my donor have MS or do they have a family history of MS? Uh, does my donor have Parkinson's or do they have a family history of Parkinson's? Whereas, uh, whereas a year ago, you probably wouldn't have worried about that at all. So uh, currently, currently the criteria that OpenBiome uses for donor screening, um, they look for young healthy donors, so they recruit them, uh, so they're based in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and they recruit them from a gym that's right around the corner from where their facility is. Um, so they look for young, healthy people. Uh, they make sure that uh, they make sure that they're not obese, because the idea that obesity has been linked to the microbiome has been around for a while. Uh, they make sure that they don't have IBD, because uh, the idea that IBD has been linked to the microbiome has also been around for a while. And they also screen for all of the stool-borne and blood-borne diseases that you can transmit from stool. So that's everything from hepatitis to HIV. Uh, but um, you know, are they screening for depression? They're starting to introduce that now. Amazingly, you can make a mouse depressed by transplanting human stool from a human who's depressed into that mouse. Just the same way that you can make a mouse fat by, uh, by starting it off germ-free and then transplanting the human stool from an obese person. So, so maybe you should worry about depression. There's not a lot of evidence that depression has been transmitted by FMT yet. Uh, but um, but uh, you know, if I personally were getting an, M uh, an FMT, I would definitely want to rule that out. And similarly, cardiovascular disease. Um, so for example, atherosclerosis has been linked to the microbiome recently, uh, and that's a very good mechanistic story around TMAO and uh, a whole lot of other things that we had no idea it was linked to, uh, even very recently. So, so, th so this, this is why the American Gastroenterological Association uh, recently got funding from NIH to set up a national fecal transplant registry where the idea is that every donor, every recipient will capture their fecal samples and we'll record all the information we can about their health and then we'll track them over the long term like 5, 10, 20 years down the track. And the biobank for that is being done right here at UCSD out of the American Gut Project. So, um, so this is the kind of thing that's emerging as a concern. There's not a lot of data yet. And uh, it's true that there's a lot of people who are walking around alive today who would be dead if they had not received an FMT, right? So if you have something as life-threatening and as severe as C. diff, it's a reasonable thing to do. If you were thinking about doing it for, say, cosmetic reasons, so there was a case report recently about, um, uh, about two men whose alopecia uh, reversed itself as a side effect of FMT. If you were thinking about doing FMT for alopecia, uh, maybe you would uh, you know, hesitate given the risks that are involved, as well as the possible benefits. So it depends a lot on what you're thinking about using it for. Um, with respect to FMT, is it known how long the uh, donor microbiota persists, um, or how long it needs to persist in order for the, the treatment to be successful? And the second part is, um, is it known, has anybody ever tried to deplete um, in, in doing FMT to actually just to transfer the metabolome of the donor to see if it was actually the small molecules that were imparting beneficial effects? Yeah, so there's been one trial looking at the metabolome uh, in humans that was successful and there's been a fair amount of, uh, a fair amount of data in mice. Um, at this point, it's a reasonable approach to try, but there's not a lot of data yet. Um, in terms of the first part, how long do the microbes need to stick around and how long do they stick around? Uh, in the study I showed you, they stick around for at least months and uh, there's other data suggesting that they can stick around for years. Um, one, one open question, both for C. diff and for other diseases that are being treated by, by FMT, and uh, what I can tell you about that is that some of the clinical trials for forms of inflammatory bowel disease have been very successful. Uh, there was also one preliminary open label trial for autism uh, that was done uh, that was published earlier this year, and that was also successful both for GI and for cognitive symptoms of autism. But uh, you'd want to hold off on that before it's replicated and before it's done in a randomised controlled trial. Uh, but there's some preliminary data that's very intriguing. Um, what we don't have yet is we don't have the overwhelming evidence base that you would need to answer a lot of the questions because in general, once people start feeling better, uh, they're often lost to follow up and they're not willing to submit to long-term tracking. And uh, for, for recurrent C. diff, in many cases, although not all cases, a single treatment of FMT has been sufficient to clear it up for at least months and in some cases years. I'm 
screen um, for diseases, whether the correlation is with or without, um, is, it, is it the presence or the lack of, of particular um, yeah, um, yeah, great, great question. So, uh, in some diseases, it seems to be uh, it seems to be the presence of microbes that are bad, and also, for example, some drug failures. So, for example, if digoxin fails for you, it's probably because you have a strain of Egitella lenta that has a plasma that uh, that encodes a, encodes an enzyme that degrades it. Uh, so, so that's definitely the presence of something. Um, there's increasing evidence that a lot of uh, a lot of diseases. Um, seem to be around the lack of something. So, for example, obesity and inflammatory bowel disease and a number of others uh, seem to have a low diversity community. But then the question is, uh, so then, then the question is still unresolved. Is diversity per se the driving factor? Or is it just that if you have a low diversity community, you're more likely to lack some of the key organisms? And uh, that, that's something that we're actively researching at the moment, especially comparing IBD across a number of different populations. Um, part, part of the reason that a lot of the answers to these questions are unresolved is that remember that these techniques have only been available for a few years. And this is what's so incredibly exciting for our students here at UCSD and uh, elsewhere around the world, right? Because a lot of these things, if you had tried to do it uh, 10 years ago, it would have been like a $100 million project. But now, the, and now you can do it for a few thousand to a few tens of thousands of dollars. So it's actually feasible. And, so, uh, and, and yet no one knows the answer. So there's this huge explosion of microbiome studies going on at the moment. Uh, just because it's so much more feasible than it was to do it a few years ago. It's like the difference between you want to do photography and you have to build your own darkroom and mix your own chemicals and uh, you know make your own photographic plates versus you have a camera on your cell phone and you can just snap pictures whenever you want. So we're getting much more towards that. You can snap pictures wherever you want phase. And as a result, we have a lot more pictures of what microbiome looks like. How does the antibiotics fed to the meat we eat affect the diversity in the gut? Uh, again, that's a great question. So we actually, so, so the short answer is no one knows. Um, what is known is primarily how antibiotics fed to livestock lead to, uh, lead to resistant strains of bacteria that can then affect people in hospitals and, co and cause harm that way. Um, Julia Gogetz, who's, um, who's a very talented uh, postdoc in Peter Durrestein's lab, uh, is, recent, uh, is, is just launching a um, global foodomics project, uh, which is a spin-off of the, of, of the American Gut Project. And what she's done already just over the summer is run thousands of samples of food through the mass spectrometer so we can figure out its chemical composition. And then we've been lining that up with thousands of fecal samples that we've run through American Gut so we can figure out what comes out the, uh, the other end. Um, one, one thing that was really surprising in American gut is there's a lot of people who don't think they've been on antibiotics in the last year, uh, but when we, when we did metabolomics on their stool samples, we, we detected the breakdown products of antibiotics in their stool nonetheless. And uh, we think that a lot of that's coming from illegal aquaculture uh, uh, operations. So for example, in Thailand and uh, Cambodia and a number of, uh, of other Southeast Asian countries, incredibly high doses of antibiotics are used to keep the shrimp, uh, I'm not going to say healthy, but not so sick that they can't sell them. And, uh, and that kind of thing is probably where you're getting your therapeutic doses from, uh, not, from the mus uh, not from the muscle tissue of a cow or a chicken. But, uh, but uh, one thing we're trying to understand right now is uh, where, where, like where in the food environment uh, are the risks for, for those very high doses of antibiotics because we are seeing some in people who think they're antibiotic free. Given all the insights being gained with the explosion of new research, I'm just curious, do you feel like your um, initial book, Follow Your Gut, from 2015 is still relevant? Or do you feel like that information has been displaced by new growth? Yeah, again, that's a great question. How long is any of these things going to last? So the, uh, the information in the 2015 book, um, Ted Books has a very short publishing cycle, so uh, so that that was that was all that was all written towards the end of 2014, and um, although we've learned a lot in three years, so we had no idea in, at the end of 2014 that we were going to find associations with Parkinson's and MS, for example. Uh, all of the stuff about the technology that we use to study the gut microbiome, all the stuff about the findings to date, and so on, uh, all of that um, all of that is still relevant. So basically, what's happened is that we've uh, filled in a lot more um, a lot more. Details rather than uh, rather than that we've overturned the picture completely. Um, with with data is good, it's very much a Q and A format based on the latest research. And so the drawback to that is that the latest research is going to change very rapidly. 
uh, there's a lot of things in there where we, we, we just admit straight up that we don't know the answer and that we hope someone will find out about the answer so we can write about it when we, when we revisit that topic in a few years. So, um, so what, what you're going to find is we tried very hard not to extrapolate beyond the current evidence. Uh, what we're trying to give you is an accurate picture, um, an accurate picture of what's out there. And so uh, in, in, in that context, like, it's important to remember, uh, you know, things like FMT, it's absolutely amazing, right, the idea that, that, that people have been cured uh, with human feces and that they're walking around alive where they would be dead if they hadn't got that treatment. But on the other hand, we're not going to cure anyone with BS. So, uh, you know, it's really important to separate the two. Thank you, Rob. Uh, thanks again, Tammy. Another round of applause.